What's going on everybody, Jolt here from the Token Minorities, and I am back with my Week 9 Team Builder of the GBAD League. This week we are against Magic Activator and the Memphis Drizzlies, uh, another one of those guys who was not very well known at all, at least in the circle that I'm involved with, and really in the greater draft community, I don't think he was very well is very well known, and honestly his content quality is very strong, so I would recommend you go give him a look. Uh, he's had a very up and down season, really a roller coaster of season I think he started the season like 0 and 3 bottom of the power rankings and then he went on this crazy four game winning streak knocking off players like Greg and Abe uh, so he's had a crazy season and now he's sitting at 4 and 4 and he actually has a chance at playoffs. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the playoff picture here before I jump into this team builder, just because it is actually impacting how I am going to approach this game. So I'm not going to show a graphic for the sake of ease and because I'm doing this in OBS and I'm not good with OBS yet, but regardless, the top three teams right now that are clinched for a playoff spot, not the seed necessarily, but the top three teams right now are six foot hacks and the Durham Dreadagons, seven and one record plus 17 differential. We have Aster J, the Montreal Hapsoles, who are six and two with a plus 14 differential. And then we have me, the Toronto Star Raptors, at six and two with a plus 11 differential. Now, all three of us are locked for a playoff spot, but our seed is impacted heavily by the results of the games this week. So, what that means is that I need to figure out what is in my best interest to get the best possible seed because I'm not out here trying to uh, trying to get the easiest matchup for me in playoffs. Everyone I play in playoffs is going to be good. Everyone in, that is even potentially in playoffs has drafted a good team. There's nothing easy. Um, some of the teams that are currently fighting for that last spot or even can jump as high as number the third seed are uh, the Texas Rangers coached by Randy. We play them in week uh, week six, I believe, and managed to pull out a victory against them. Uh, there's the Los Angeles Clefable, coached by its Gregulator. We actually lost to them 1-0. They are trying to get that fourth seed. And then also Magic Activator, my opponent this week, is currently 4-4-5 four and four minus five with a slim chance to make it into playoffs if he does very well this week against me. So there's, there's a lot going on here with this playoff race, but as far as I am concerned, my goal going into the D-League was to claim the number one overall seed. I need a little bit of help a little bit of help this week. I need Leo to lose in order for that to even be a possibility for me. But if I prep in such a way that I am trying to go for a high differential win, which I'm actually able to do more safely since my playoff spot is locked, I can take more of a high risk, high reward type of building for this week, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, essentially, that's that's what I'm trying to do. Is I'm trying to claim that number one overall seed because I'm in a position where I can make that risk where I'm bringing a bunch of setup sweepers, a bunch of things that I think can 6-0 potentially my opponent's team depending on what combination of mons that he brings. Uh, so I just wanted to give a little bit of insight on what I plan to do here this week for this matchup, but also let you know that this match means a lot to my opponent too potentially, although his, his chances of making playoffs are very slim. He has to 6-0 me, he needs Greg to lose, and he needs Randy to lose 6-0 as well for him to make playoffs. So it's very unlikely for him to get in, but it is possible. But because he does need that 6-0 mathematically, I think he's going to bring um, a lot of potential like mons that can maybe 6-0 my team in theory. Um, so I do need to keep that in mind as well and not be you know, overly aggressive and potentially just <laughs> fall all the way to the fourth seed or something, which, I mean, that's fine. It doesn't really matter if I get the fourth seed in playoffs, but, you know, it's just something to keep in mind that that might be a strategy that he is going to try to utilize here for his prep for this game. But like I said, the goal for us is number one, and that's exactly what we're going to try to do here in this matchup against Magic Activator and the Memphis Drizzlies. So uh, let's type, talk a little bit here about the matchup. As my opponent, Magic, uh, has access to Landorus, Therian, uh, Mega Venusaur, Melodic, Arcanine, Jolteon, Kartana, Komala, Togekiss, Me and Xiao, Miss Magius, and Armaldo, with the Landorus T and the Armaldo being the Z-Captains. So basically, Landorus T is the only Z-Captain, because Armaldo's not a, not a Pokemon that I will <laughs> admit actually exists on a team here. But regardless, uh, his team is pretty threatening. Uh, both offensively and defensively. It has a pretty cool momentum core with the Jolteon and the um, Yin Chao, just a nice Volt Turn core there, as well as a really stout defensive core with the Mega Venusaur, Melodic Arcanine, and even Togekiss. That's pretty fat and disgusting, and Landers T obviously can be defensive as well. Um, it, it's a pretty cool team. The the issue that I see with it is that it's very linear. Um, it's, it's, very, it's very clear, to me at least, what these Pokemon can do or what they are most likely to do in a matchup against a bulky offensive team like mine. I'm not going to see 
sets, I think that'll blow me away, quite honestly, in this matchup. Not only because I, I think Magic might be a little less experienced in format than a lot of us in the league right now, uh, but also just because this team doesn't really allow for it, um, especially the defensive core. Like, I'm a big fan of defensive cores that are hard to predict, that can bring a lot of stuff. Like Mew, I've used defensively. It can also do a lot of freaking stuff. Uh, Mega Kangaskhan, I've used defensively. It can also do a lot of stuff, and etc. Kovali, Nia Queen, all of my team, all of my defensive members, most of my defensive members, can do a lot of stuff. And I don't really think I can say that about his, with Melodic being pretty straightforward, Mega Venusaur, pretty straightforward. It can do, like, Curse and SD and stuff like that, but that's not something you typically see. Uh, I, I definitely don't expect to see it here in this matchup, specifically. Arcanine is probably the most versatile defensive Mon he has on his team, but also not one that I feel matches up particularly well. It's okay against me, but not, not the best. Uh, definitely not offensively. I think, like, a specially defensive Arcanine could be decent against uh, combinations like Mew and Torn T, if you want to bring specially defensive thinking that can deal with both of those but I always have things like the Rotom and the Seismitoad that could potentially switch into that as well and give it a hard time uh, and maybe even gain some sort of advantage against it with uh, Hazards as I could set up Hazards with Seismitoad, I can Toxic it, I Earth Power Scald, which this team doesn't really like switching into either of those quite honestly. So um, yeah, so j just a few thoughts here, but I, I really have noticed a trend in his building throughout the season where he likes to bring defense. Uh, he, he values defense over offense and that's something that I can definitely keep in mind for my building knowing that he's going to bring a bunch of defensive checks to things if he can and um, that is something that my team is designed to be able to abuse if the matchup calls for it uh, again going back to my good old friend taunt uh, as several members of my team do get taunt his team is super freaking weak to taunt uh, and it's something that I will be exploiting in this matchup because taunt ensures that his defensive Pokemon stay low on health that's the key thing he has had a lot of games that have gone down to timer essentially or very close to timer I think one of them actually went to timer uh, because he has such a thick defensive core that's able to uh, help him survive for as long as possible during the Wi-Fi battle timer. I am not going to let that happen. I am going to design a team that makes the game short. I'm going to design a team that gives me the highest chance of a high differential win, high risk, high reward, lots of setup opportunities with my team, and the goal is to win big, because if I win big, I have a chance of catching Leo. I'll also need Aster to probably lose, and I'll need Leo to lose by, you know, at least a decent margin to be able to catch him. I think I can catch Leo regardless if he loses and I win big, but regardless, that's the idea. I need to win big, and I'm going to make sure he is not able to stall out the battle timer on me, as that is something his team is very good at doing. I'm not saying it's a it's a bad strategy by any means. It's fine. It's Wi-Fi. That's something that people can do. It's just something that I don't want to allow to happen here in this matchup, especially when I feel like I have the tools to really put myself in a solid position against him in this game. So um, I've talked a little bit about his team, uh, and just to talk about some of the bigger threats on my team before I show you the team that I've decided to bring here, uh, the Mew absolutely annihilates everything that just everything <laughs> his entire team all right let's look at his team his psychic resists are Kartana. <laughs> that's it and as i'm sure many of you know uh Kartana has paper thin special defensive stat or has a paper thin special defensive stat which means it's not a psychic resist quite frankly it's to a ko'd by uninvested psychic and what that means is that i only need psychic on my mew in terms of offensive coverage and what that means is that's the most obvious win condition of my life. But I can't rely on that entirely in case he sees that coming. And because he's been using this team all season long, he knows he doesn't have Psychic Resist. He knows people like Leo last week tried to bring some sort of crazy setup or Uniclus. He has seen set up Psychic types all season long. I know he'll be ready for it. So I need to have extra win conditions in the back to make sure that's not the only thing I'm relying on to get this high differential win. So another thing I can do is bring Skull to with Swords Dance. It's the combination of Aqua Tail, Poison Jab, and Mega Horn beats his entire team as well after a swords dance and Skullipede is able to set up on a variety of things on his team too including a choice lock Kartana into Leaf Blade I can set up on a choice lock Mean Chow into High Jump Kick or Knock Off even if I'm a Z move um, there's a lot of offensive members of his team that I can set up on and in fact even like Honestly, Choice Locked Lando, I'm pretty sure an invested Scolipede, like a little bit of HP, can take an Earthquake from Lando. Uh, so I could even potentially set up on that. And his priority options are fairly limited on his team. And by limited, I mean I think his only one is Extreme Speed Arcanine. So, uh, yeah, that's that's certainly something I could see winning this game as well, and that Scolipede given the right circumstances. So those are the two Mons that I'm going to try to win this game with. So I need to weaken down his team so that those Mons can win. That's the idea I'm going to work with. Let's go ahead and hop 
hop right on over to the battle really quickly. Um, and as you can see, we're going to kick it off with this Mew. So this Mew is uh, pretty, pretty darn solid against him, okay? Uh, so it's Taunt, Roost, Psychic, and Calm Mind. I already talked about how he doesn't have a Psychic Resist, so therefore Calm Mind, Roost, Psychic uh, obliterates his team. Now I have Taunt because his ways to deal with Setup Sweepers include Haze Melodic, Roar Arcanine, uh, maybe Roar Mega Venusaur, and the only other non, the only other attacking method that he has to get this Mew out is with Dragon Tail Melodic. The thing is, I kind of expect him to expect me to run sub on my on my Mew instead of Taunt. It's kind of a 50-50 of sorts, but regardless, I have the means on my team to really pressure the Melodic and make sure it's not able to beat this anyways, and especially if I'm able to get up a Calm Mind to do a lot of damage to him on the turn that he phases me, and I can always come back in later and win the game later on if I need to. So this is an absolute monster, destroys everything on his team, and I don't know how he's going to beat it without losing several Pokemon. Um, there's a few ways he can work around it. Slow U-turn and do a fast offensive check is something he could do. His offensive checks might be like X's or Kartana. Uh, maybe a Choice Scarfed Arcanine could do some damage to me with Flare Blitz. Uh, Choice Scarfed Lando's U-turn knockoff could do a lot to me as well, or even just an Earthquake or something, but regardless, this is an absolutely amazing Pokemon against this team. He really, really should have drafted some better responses to Psychic types, as this is going to show, I think, how painfully weak his team really is to Psychic types, and to the point where I don't think he can beat this Pokemon. He might be able, well, he could probably beat it eventually, but um, it will take so much prep to where he'll be left very vulnerable to the rest of the members of my team. So just to talk a little bit about the spread here, max HP and 20 defense allows me to survive a Z fly adamant from a Landorus T, which I think is his best offensive check to this, considering I'm only running Psychic and not Ice Beam. Landorus T likely will be able to take a hit from this unless he lets it get lets it gets lets it get a weakened early in the game. Uh, so I wanted to be able to live that hit, maybe even roost that off because I'd be able to get back above 50% and potentially survive the next hit he goes for, as I think he's more more likely to actually be Jolly instead of Adamant Lander's T. So I should be able to actually take the combination Z Fly and Earthquake, which is pretty nice. Uh, and now, you know, ensure Mew is able to win this game. And the, the speed investment allows me to outspeed a max speed Landorus T. So this is the primary win condition because of his lack of resist to uh, Psychic types. But let's talk about something else he doesn't have switch ins to, and that's Flying types. Um, his only Flying resist is Jolteon, and that's not a resist. Um, that, that takes a lot from Life Orb Hurricane, and that's why you see Life Orb Torn T here, which has enough speed investment, I believe, for the Kartana, which is his fastest member um, outside of Scarfers, and even though I kind of expect Kartana to be Choice Scarfed if he brings it, it's still good to outspeed just in case it's like a Swords Dance variant, uh, as that could very well be a threat to my team late game. So, uh, Combination Hurricane Hidden Power Ice uh, hits everything at least neutrally, because Hurricane hits everything except Jolteon at least neutrally. Uh, so the HP Ice is specifically for the Landers team, obviously, and because of my HP and Defense investment, I'm actually guaranteed to survive an Adamant Stonage from Landers T as well. Not Life Orb, but I rarely see Life Orb Landers T anyway, so I can guaranteed survive an Adamant Stone Edge from Landers T. Uh, if he is Jolly, I guaranteed survive the at the Stone Edge plus Life Orb recoil, and I guaranteed survive a Scarfed Mian Chow Adamant uh, Stone Edge as well from full health and survive the life flip recoil as well on that. So that makes Torrenty a really good anti-lead against this team. The only way that I will not lead Torrenty is if he has Jolteon on his roster because looking at my team, I could very well see Jolteon leading to counter lead the obvious Torrenty. So this is a very, very good mod against this team. If he does bring Jolteon, I expect him to lead with it. I'm actually going to lead with my Mew because Jolteon cannot 2 it KO my Mute, or can, but I can Roost. So I can Roost on the Jolteon and scout out what type of Jolteon it is so that I can approach it appropriately later on in the game. And regardless of Mew being the win con, I'm not afraid of letting it take the hit from Jolteon just to scout out what it wants to do. So that's my game plan early game, is to either lead Torrenty or Mew and just uh, basically adapt accordingly. The combination of Taunt on Mew and Taunt on Torrenty ensures that his defensive Pokemon that are trying to switch into these monsters cannot recover, and Torrenty is so good at keeping things like the Malay Melodic especially low in health, and Melodic is, with Dragon Tail, the only true defensive check to the Mew, and if I'm able to keep that thing low because of Taunt from Torrenty, because Melodic is overall his best switch into Torrenty, that makes the Mew all the more of a threat late game, so this combination supports each other super well. 
on that. Now, knockoff is just to get rid of Rocky Helmets for the Mega Kangaskhan. Potentially, Melodic will be Rocky Helmet. That could be nice late game as well, or just any time during the game to get rid of that Rocky Helmet, as well as maybe potentially knocking off a Rocky Helmet on the Specially Defensive Arcanine. I just feel like in this matchup, his switch ins to Kang are similar to his switch ins to the Torn T, so knockoff is a very valuable move. And then finally, Taunt Line, I already mentioned why on that. So next up is the Skullipede. I mentioned this as well earlier. SD Skullipede absolutely dismantles his team as well. Uh, combination of Z Aqua Tail, Mega Horn, and Poison Jab hits everything. His best switch ins to Skullipede are Arcanine and Lander's T. Z Aqua Tail, you know, uh, not a whole lot they can do about that. So offensively, I feel like my matchup is super good. Okay, my matchup against him is really, really good. Uh, he just doesn't have the responses to this core of Pokemon to be able to, in my opinion, be able to win this game. But my goal isn't just to win this game, my goal is to win big because I want to have the best chance possible at that number one seed. So this combination also puts me in a very good chance to win big and win early in the game, which is exactly the game plan moving forward. So not a whole lot else to talk about on this. I do have a little bit of HP investment favored over my attack investment, specifically to be able to set up on Mega Venusaur a little bit more easily, but otherwise it is a relatively self-explanatory set. So that's the offensive core, or at least the, the sweeper core. The sweeper and just, you know, pure annoyance and torrent but let's be honest, they could sweep them too, depending on what he brings since he doesn't have that fly and resist so now let's talk a little bit about my defensive pivots to get to work around his team just to make sure his best checks to these mons cannot uh, put in too much work against my team so some of the best checks let's talk about that first i think the togekiss with a choice scarf or kartana with a choice scarf are coming guaranteed maybe both but i think one or the other will be choice scarfed and not both regardless i need to have excellent responses to both of those the obvious response to both of those is Rotom Heat. Rotom Heat being able to very easily deal with Kartana, of course, especially if I can keep Stealth Rocks off the field, which my team is also very good at doing, as his only Stealth Rockers are Landers T and Armaldo. Armaldo is simply not coming, and, Land and uh, Landers T is pressured super heavily by this team from via Taunt, via Z-Aqua Tail, via even Will-O-Wisp from this Rotom Heat, uh, Skull from Seismitoad, and, and uh, you'll see Ice Punch on the Mega Kangaskhan as well. So it's not easy for him to get up Stealth Rocks, especially early game, and that means that this probably will be able to stay at high health uh, for the vast majority of the game, only taking hits from the Kartana as needed, potentially taking a hit from Togekiss on an expected Thunder Wave or just on an expected hit that I don't want anything else to take, essentially. So uh, speed on this does allow me to outpace the um, an uninvested Lander's T, I believe, is what I went for, like a four-speed Lander's T. I didn't think it was very likely for him to bring that, but I felt like just in case he was a defensive Rocky Helmet or defensive Pasho Berry, uh, Lander's T for the um, Skullipede, expecting that to be a big threat, it'd be good to outspeed that and be able to uh, fire off a Will-O-Wisp on it. I think if he brings like a, a bulkier Lando T, it might be more likely for him to outspeed Nidoqueen. Um, that's definitely something I could see happening, but I wasn't willing to invest that much in my defenses or in my speed uh, because it would take away from the defenses that I need to be able to take hits from Kartana especially. Um, so that's the idea behind that. The, uh, the moveset here is kind of interesting. So Volt Switch for obvious momentum, that's fine. Uh, Will-O-Wisp specifically to allow me to have the best possible way to hit the Landorus. I don't expect sub Landorus. Uh, sub would be the only real way to beat this Rotom set. Um, but I don't think he can afford to run sub if he wants to have a setup move and rocks. Um, if he runs sub, he doesn't have rocks. and it means my whole team is doing better throughout the game. I think because he needs to have Earthquake, he needs to have some sort of way to hit Torn T, which would either be uh, Stone Edge or Z Fly, I think. Um, and he wants Stealth Rock, and just knowing how magic builds, it'll probably have U Turn as well. Um, he likes to bring U Turn quite a bit. He likes to bring like one or two momentum users on each team, um, being like the Mian Chao or the uh, Jolteon or even this Landers T. It's usually one of the, or like, it's like two to three of actually all those, quite honestly. Um, so I'm not really expecting him to have sub, and even if he doesn't bring U-Turn, I really don't think sub would be his choice. I think there's a lot of other things he can do. Uh, maybe even knockoff would be a nice choice against my team to help him wear down some of my stuff or maybe like rock polish is something that I would have expected as well potentially um so yeah just just some something to think about there but pain split for recovery obviously versus the Kartana this is my primary switch and because of the Rocky Helmet being able to will whittle him down over time and if the Kartana ever locks into Leaf Blake one honestly it's GG if he's scarfed because Skullipede comes in uh for free and just 
gets plus two and then he can't do much about it quite honestly so uh yeah uh, there's there's a few ways he can obviously prevent the sweep with through it like double intimidate and like priority from arcanine and whatnot but maybe i shouldn't say it's gg but it's a couple kills at least i think for the skull if that happens so um yeah i really feel like this team keeps kartana in check very well especially scarfed sd might be a little scary if he's like that timid set that boosts speed but um you know we'll, we'll see what he decides to bring on that but I think I do have the tools to deal with Kartana pretty well, but I do still feel a little bit weak to potential Scarf Togekiss or just Togekiss in general. Um, more so Scarf, actually, because all my team is able to deal with um, defensive Togekiss in some capacity. Scarf is the one that's a little bit scary. So I wanted one more way to help me deal with a Scarf Togekiss, just because I know my luck with Air Slash Flinches and Serene Grace is just not, you know, not my thing. Uh, so I wanted to have extra ways to deal with that. I didn't mention Hex. Hex is to help me against Miss Magius as well as hit the Jolteon without taking, uh, without dropping my special attack by two and making the landers seem super free to you know switch in and set up on me and whatnot so hex just allows me to have a little bit of extra damage output versus also a potential um potential uh what was i thinking against a potential like toxic arcanine um as i do have toxic on the seismic toad that i'll go ahead and show now that would um do a little more damage to him as well and maybe be able to, to hex into a volt switch and get momentum on him etc so uh next up is the seismic toad this is a pretty straightforward set because it has exactly one job and that is to take special hits as well as possible including from the jolteon as well as from the togekiss as with full special defense investment and leftovers i know that i'll be able to take several air slashes from the togekiss and hopefully eventually get a toxic on it and that's all i need if it's a scarf token kiss if i just get a toxic on it it's no longer as big of a threat because while it might be able to flinch me down it will wear itself down over time especially in addition to stealth rocks which i do plan to have on the field for most of the game uh if i have anything to say about it so um yeah that's that's this thing's job is just to take hits from jolteon and to deal and to take hits as much as possible from the togekiss until i can get a toxic on it and once that has happened then i should be okay here in this game i feel as I don't want that scarfed flincher to be a win con for him essentially and this prevents that from being the case um, so then I just have dual stab for my offenses against him just because it hits everything on his team uh, pretty much as hard as possible he has a couple grass types which does kind of suck uh, for seismitoad is able to switch into those pretty easily but if he decides to go hard kartana it will not appreciate an earth power and if he decides to go mega venusaur earth power still does a decent amount of damage to him on switch in which will help out things like my mew and my scolipede later in the game as well as this next monster here which is the mega kangaskhan a mega kangaskhan is coming this week not because i think it's a good sweeper but it is a very good breaker and it also is fantastic for priority against his threats as something like the Jolteon offensively could be very annoying for my team just because I don't have a choice scarfer on this team to outspeed it um, but even if I did he's been known to run flame warp Jolteon so it might not even matter if I had the flame warp quick feet that is so it might not even matter if I had a scarfer to outspeed it so that's why I thought that my better way to check it was through priority uh, and that's exactly what I'm going for here in uh, on this team so the combination of double edge ice punch and earthquake uh, yeah show me the switch in because it does not exist his only way to really deal with this is something like a fizz def max max rocky helmet togekiss or maybe a rocky helmet melodic both of which are pressured heavily by the rest of my team so i felt like mega kangaskhan was a super solid bring here in this matchup it's also an additional way to check an adamant sd uh an sd uh, lander's t if somehow you know my my uh, to my uh, torn t and my skull peak both go down or a weekend and can't like bring them in on rocks or whatever then i have this extra way to deal with that as well as just a general way to uh hit his entire wall core for neutral damage as i don't i don't recall him having a steel type except like cartana okay cartana is a steel type fine that's not a great switch into double edge, quite frankly. It can take the double edge, sure, but one, I have a Rotom Heat that can just switch in for free and hurt him further with a Rocky Helmet, and two, that's just letting the Kartana get weakened, um, and I don't really see him making that play more than once in a game, so later on when I bring Kangaskhan back in, it's going to be sad times for whatever his other switch-ins are going to be. Even if I take Rocky Helmet damage, I am still dropping a fat nuke on whatever decides to come in. So, um, you know, that's the team here. Uh, it's, it's a very solid team. It's, like I said, a little high risk, high reward. Um, but I don't think the risk is actually that high. I think this team has a very good chance of winning regardless of how aggressively I play it just because the offensive members match up so well, but I intend to play it very aggressively because I want the high differential win. 
Um, and this is not at all meant to disrespect my opponent. I hope he doesn't take that as disrespect. That's just my strategy for this game. I would do this if I was playing someone like Abe, who I respect so much as a battler. I would go for a very high differential win in this situation. Um, so that's that's just the strategy here. And yeah, so we'll see how it goes. Um, Magic has been pretty much red hot here for the back half of the season, so it will not be easy to get the differential of win that I want to get that number one seed. But it's the goal, and we'll see if we can do it and maybe finish off this regular season of the D-League 7-2 and two with a pretty nice differential. So that's the goal. We'll see how it goes. Regardless, we're in playoffs, so that's not really relevant. This is just to determine where we will stand in the playoffs and maybe who our playoff opponent will be. So thanks for watching, guys. I hope you did enjoy, and sometime tomorrow you'll end up seeing the battle here between me and Magic, and we'll see how it goes. I'm really excited for it, and also really excited for playoffs coming up soon, and I hope you are as well. So have a good one, guys. Later.